I'm down here at Kaizen Education Services, and we are going to talk to Samantha, the founder, and learn all about how they're empowering brains and lives to thrive. These guys are doing amazing things with kids that have ADHD, so those kids can understand themselves and thrive in this world. Stay tuned, check us out, don't miss an episode, this stuff's powerful. I'm here down in Kensington at Kaizen Educational Services. I'm with Samantha and John. Samantha, you're the founder of Kaizen. Can you tell me, you know, what is it that you guys do and how did you come up with this idea? So I was a teacher okay. uh, six, for 16, 17 years, <laughs> long time. And I was an elementary teacher. I went into administration and then I transitioned into a counseling department in student services. Yeah. Uh, working with kids in educate, well, what was it called? Academic support. Okay. That was my role. Yeah. So I was working with, and you're going to hear me be a bit sarcastic, but I was working with all the kids that couldn't learn, right? Like I was sent those kids yeah. that were very misunderstood or um, mislabeled and they were struggling. Yeah. And we couldn't figure out why they were struggling because these were really, really <laughs> smart kids. And it's like, what was that? And that was a, quite a while ago before we knew about something called executive functioning. Right. And it was before we knew a lot about the brain. As educators, we weren't taught about brains and learning, which sounds strange. Yeah. Um, but we weren't because we didn't know what we know now. But now uh, we know better so we can do better. And off I went to try and figure out what, what is this gap with these really, really bright kids yes. who have a ton of support, um, but aren't reaching potential. Right. That was always on the report card, not reaching potential or could do better in, or if they mm. stayed focused, they could. Right. Or uh, what were some other phrases I heard? Um, way back in the day, I heard things like lazy, unmotivated, disorganized, not meeting potential. Right. Um, and it was a real struggle. These teachers were really trying to work with these kids, but we couldn't figure it out. So I went to, just coincidentally, went to some workshops with uh, Dr. Peg Dawson, who is an executive skills guru, okay. and learned about this thing called executive functioning, which is um, all of the management system of a brain. Right. We like to call it the CEO of the brain, organizes <laughs> okay. all the pieces, all right. Yeah, right? Yeah. Make sure everyone's doing their job <laughs> so that you get a great product or an orchestra. Yeah, yeah. Right? The conductor of an orchestra, okay. making sure all the instruments play. The problem was these kiddos that I was working with really had lagging executive functioning skills. Okay. Those were things like time management, organization, planning, prioritization, attention, and often that led to behavior issues. Right. And so then I went to another workshop with um, Dr. Ross Green, okay. who is the most amazing guru ever when it comes to behavior, I think. And he said a phrase to me, not to me personally, but I internalized it as personal, which was, um, Behavior is just an indicator of a lagging skill or unsolved problem. So if we put behavior on the shelf, what is the lagging skill or unsolved problem? With these kiddos, it was executive functioning. So that led me down a journey to really like a neuroscience research journey for a number of years, digging in, yeah. learning a bunch of psychology. I'm not a psychologist. <laughs> Met my good buddy John here, who is the psychologist. Right. And just learned and learned and learned and thought, hey, what if we actually start to teach kiddos these skills? And what if we start to implement structures in classrooms yes. to teach these skills? And you have something which we're going to talk about later in another episode coming out to help those teachers. So you have to check that out. If you're a teacher or your parent and you you're, need help and your teacher needs help, you got to check out that episode. I think that's number four. We're going to talk mm -hmm. about that. But so, and you met John and John, you're a psychologist with hexagon psychology is that That's correct right, yeah. um so they don't have executive functioning we call it adhd right so a lot of times we term this adhd what signs should a parent look for for adhd like what are they going to see well, typically what you're going to see is is a typical kid doing typical kid stuff so one of the things i always put out there with parents or teachers is 
we all have symptoms of ADHD. And so whenever I do talks or, you know, Sam and I do talks, really a lot of people leave with the idea that they themselves or all of the kids that they see have ADHD. And it's certainly not the case. So I'll put that out there as a caveat. Okay. But typically you're looking at significant um, behaviors related to inattention on okay. the one side and as well as impulsivity or hyperactivity on the other side. So within attention, it's kind of frequent daydreaming um, or kind of their heads are in the clouds or like a lot of the, the cliche in society is squirrel, um, <laughs> you know, looking out of the classroom window, um, things like that. M careless mistakes, math in particular, writing, missing periods. They've been told several times, don't forget your period at the end of the sentence. And they always forget the period at the end of the sentence. Routines at home that are inattentive, you know, when parents or caregivers are giving multi-step instructions that are age appropriate, good luck. They're not remembering the, yeah, they're, you've given them three things, go upstairs, you know, comb your hair, brush your teeth, bring down your dirty clothes, and they forgot all of that. Um, poor time management is certainly one of them. And then on the impulsive side of things, it's, it's frigidiness, wrestle, restless legs. They're always on the go, driven by a motor. We used to have a joke in the clinic when we were trained. Um, that if we're assessing a kid and the kid falls out of his chair at least once, it's ADD and we're done with the assessment, which sometimes saves parents a lot of money. So um, <laughs> it's stuff like that. It's impulsivity. It's blurting out in class, not raising the hand. It's also stuff like for those of you that are moms, you know, the kids that are like, mom, 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 and just not realizing that mom or teacher are not responding and not being able to adjust their behavioral strategy of maybe I'll be quiet, raise my hand and the teacher might call on me. Right. Or maybe if I'm quiet, my mom's going to answer me. So things like that are, are indicators to maybe take a look at potential ADHD. But again, that's true of all kids. So we have to be careful of the TikTok videos and the Facebook right. videos that we watch. And then we go ahead and label, you know, or think that we label kids with ADHD. Okay, I have a couple of follow-up questions to this. Mm -hmm. Is it a spectrum or is it an on-off switch? Like you either have it or you don't, or is it like you have it, you can function and you're okay, or you have it and you're you're struggling to function within society's bounds? Uh, my, my opinion on that, I, it's interesting. Yeah, that's an interesting question. So I would say it is a bit of a spectrum. You can have mild, moderate, and kind of severe. I think on any given day, we all have ADHD. We certainly all have lagging executive functioning skills. Show me someone who's tired, they have symptoms of ADHD. So show me someone who's stressed, they have symptoms of ADHD. So um, I do think it's a bit of a spectrum, but, but the key component here that a lot of people miss is it's not about the symptoms. We can all have symptoms and function fine or within reason of fine. It's about the functional impairment that those symptoms are causing. So that's really when we're diagnosing or formally diagnosing, we're looking at symptoms, yes, but we're looking at functional impairment and also trying to rule out other factors that could be contributing to the same type of symptomology. And that's really how you get a diagnosis of ADHD. It's more complicated than I think what people think. Yeah. Um, and to do a good ADHD assessment, you're doing a complete child assessment and an environmental assessment as well. You know, it, it's so interesting you say this is an, and, and like recognizing the signs and symptoms. Like my son, I didn't have any other litmus test. Like I honestly thought it was normal to take 20 minutes to put your shoes on. Like I thought that that's what a normal kid's behavior was. And it wasn't until I had the support systems and the diagnosis where I went, oh my goodness, right? And I got to the point where I could connect with my son and I wasn't constantly frustrated. And, and that frustrated frustration, you know, towards your child causes an impact. Mm -hmm. And if you don't catch this early, like I was fortunate, I had a support system that caught it early and we helped support him to thrive. But if you don't, there's so much more impact. Let's talk a little bit about that impact. What does that look like? Um, so a lot of the students, um, as I was saying earlier, just have been labeled and, and often we're worried about a label from a diagnosis, but often the labeling has already started and maybe not in a positive way. And the labeling involves, you know, them being called lazy, unmotivated, not trying hard enough, um, disorganized. Um, I call it the should factor. You should be able to, mm -hmm. by this age, you should, you know, so-and-so can do this. Um, in the school system, it might sound like you're in grade whatever, eight now, you should be able to, right? And kiddos who have been diagnosed with ADHD or struggling with executive functioning, um, they can't. And so they've heard this perhaps at home and they've heard it at school. So from a mental health perspective, by the time they get to us, we're often looking at anxiety, depression, that's where at certain levels we refer out um, for support as well. Yeah. But we also look at it as 
um, executive functioning coaching almost as a mental health intervention nowadays in this age of information overload. Yep. Kids are being inundated, parents are inundated, we're all inundated. Right. And so it's teaching those skills of filtering out and really focusing in on those coping strategies yeah. in life so that we can be, yes, successful in school, yeah. but more importantly in life. Like once you leave that scaffolding yes, yes. and you get into university and you start a career, you know, we say from the classroom to the boardroom. Yes. We just happen to catch them right now. Yeah. Um, but there are adults who struggle with this, especially post pandemic or during the pandemic. Right. How many people actually thought they had ADHD because they couldn't um, work in this new environment? Right. So um, I think the mental health implications, and probably you can speak better to that than me as far as from a clinical perspective, is when we see those kiddos, um, that shame cycle has started. And the self-talk of, I'm not good enough. I don't know how it, it, it can't be done in 10 sessions. Yeah. So depending on the severity of what's happened, um, we can work with students in 10 sessions, 20 sessions, 30 sessions, whatever it's it takes. completely individualized. I like that because yeah. everyone's unique, right? Every brain is different. And you see that, you see that impact as well. The, like the negativity. Of the yeah, absolutely. Just to piggyback off Sam, she said I could speak to her better than she could. I certainly cannot speak to her to speak to it better than she could. But I would add um, that when you do get a diagnosis of ADHD, it's often a diagnosis of, um, like I was saying earlier, incompetence. And so people and kids with ADHD, they start to internalize a sense of self that's not an accurate reflection of who they are and what their strengths are. So by the time they get to me or my colleagues, psychologists or counselors, then there is this internalized shame cycle where they're not good enough um, and they're not competent enough. And so what we see by the age of, what did you say, grade seven, eight or nine, um, we start to see people or kids shutting down and it's because they're afraid to take a risk. And taking a risk means raising your hand, trying out for a team, um, getting a driver's license, handing in your math homework, letting your teacher see your writing. Those are all risks of ego. And if your ego is to say your self-esteem has been trampled and there's too, been too much critical feedback in your life, then you're not willing to take the risk. So in order to protect that, you shut down. And when you shut down, now you look lazy and unmotivated. And that's now the feedback you're getting from life. So then it does create anxiety and depression. So on our side of things, that's where we treat clinically anxiety and depression. But executive functioning intervention is in itself a mental health intervention. And it's certainly a preemptive, if nothing else, in a, in a, in a maintenance phase of mental health. And so um, I think it's really important when you're talking about ADHD, you are talking about mental health and what comes with it, which is, which is lower self-esteem oftentimes. And if you control for IQ, which is the majority of us in society, it's your self-esteem and your motivation that'll predict your success. And so that's where the key intervention is. ADHD is not an issue of knowledge, it's an issue of performance. And so helping kids perform increases self-esteem, which allows them to live up to their potential. Just like you would have a coach in any sport it's to help performance. It's 100%. Yeah. I love and that. practice the skill, yeah. right? Practice makes permanent. So it's it's equating it to a sport often. We work with a lot of athletes because that yeah. analogy works so well. Right? It's yeah. like, just like anything, you have to practice yeah, time right. management. You have to practice impulse control. Absolutely. I love that. And you have some kids here, so let's go maybe take a look and maybe they'll talk to us. Perfect. Awesome. Hi, Michael. So you're here at Kaizen. And how long have you been working with these guys? Uh, I think it's been like almost two years. Nice. What what uh, What's it like? Tell me. It's pretty good. Aggies helped me with sort all sorts of things. Uh, at, our first session, I believe, was about like, I think it was like anger management and stuff. Stuff about ADHD, just controlling my emotions. Right? That's yeah. Adults can't even do that sometimes, but it's mm -hmm. so amazing that you're learning those skills. What, uh, what's one of the things that you learned about yourself that you found really powerful? Uh, that even though I have ADHD, it's not a it. Not shouldn't really be labeled a disorder, mm -hmm. more of like something that's just a bit different from other people, right? Because it does help in some case, some places like math. Because even though I'm slow at it, I can do it. 
Yeah. And you find that you're probably really good in some things that your classmates aren't as good in. Yeah. What's your superpower? Uh, I'd say it's probably math. Yeah. Nice. You like solving problems then. Yeah. It's good. That's awesome. And you enjoy coming here with Eggy and, and you get to do things like this. Yes. Right? And foosball. And foosball. foosball. Oh, we'll have to check out the foosball. Awesome. Do you win? Yes. Okay. <laughs> By a, like a lot. Eggy needs to up her foosball game is what I hear. Yes. Uh, awesome. He's what? my strongest competitor. Okay. Yeah. That just makes yeah. permanent. Yes. Exactly. Get That's practicing. right. That's right. So how long do you spend here in a day? Like a, an hour with Eggy? Yep, an hour. And how much foosball do you get to play? Like 15 minutes, oh, that's sometimes less. Oh, okay. More or less. More or less, nice. And you don't work on homework here? Uh, sometimes. Sometimes? Mm -hmm. Okay, you do. And you work on homework, but you also work on self-awareness? Uh, self-awareness, uh, yeah, stuff like that. Understanding the brain functions? Yes. Tell me about brain functions. How does it work? Uh, so there's the amygdala, otherwise known as Amy G. Dalla, uh, the hippocampus, and the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is the uh, like this thinking one, right? The one that actually comes up with the good answers. Okay. The amygdala is like fight, flight, or freeze. Those responses and right. the Hippocampus is the uh, like memory vault. Wow, I, di I didn't even know that. You're teaching me stuff, that's amazing. And so understanding your brain helps you to understand, you know, the behaviors, the emotions in that piece. Mm-hmm. Yeah? Yep. And would you recommend it for other kids? Definitely. Yeah? Do you find it fun as well as educational? Yes. Awesome, I love that. And what's one thing you would recommend to a kid who might be struggling with ADHD? What would they do? Don't think of it as something that puts you down. Think of it as something as think of it as a strength. Yeah. Cuz you're going to even though you have ADHD, you it's helpful. It can be helpful in multiple ways. That's beautiful. Thank you so much, Michael. That was amazing. Oh my goodness, that was so powerful. Like hearing it from the kids and the, the confidence we saw in Michael. Mm -hmm. The work you guys are doing is amazing. It really, um, and that was authentic. Like he hadn't been prepped or anything. So he just agreed to do this. And, and that really is why we do what we do. It is, that's, when Michael first came to us, I mean, if you could see the change, change. Um, it's just inspiring to hear kids speak their truth yes. in a very safe space. And that's what Kaizen is. It's a safe place to understand your brain and there's no marks attached to it. There's no honor roll. No pressure. No pressure. And it's it's learning about yourself, your brain, and empowering parents along the way. And eventually with Brain Hub, it's going to be empowering educators to do that work as well. And we're gonna talk about that in the next episode, Brain Hub and what the tools are for educators that you're coming out oh, with in so January. That. that is amazing. So for parents to get a hold of you, uh, to give their kids the support they need, how do they get a hold of you? So they go to our website, which is www.kaizeneduke.com and they can just, uh, there's a, a form they can fill out to get a hold of us and learn more. Excellent. We'll put all the details in the description below. If you need support system in your life, and every parent does, uh, definitely recommend coming down to speak to Samantha and her team at Kaizen. Just incredible work that they're doing. And we'll thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here. It was really lovely having you here. Thank you <laughs> Thank so you. much. And we'll see you next time.